Good afternoon and welcome to Wintergreen Studios Virtual Land Art Bio Blitz. You are at the Lessons in a Backpack session with Kelly McGann. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jess Pilo and I am a project coordinator at Wintergreen Studios and I'm your video host for today. And now I am very happy to introduce our final speaker of the day. We are joined by Kelly McGann, who is the program manager for the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network. And Kelly is here to introduce the Lessons in a Backpack program. She will share a video that she's put together that demonstrates how to use one of the Lessons in a Backpack. And then she will be available for a live Q&A. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you for having me. So the program that we're going to be looking at today uh, comes from our grade four uh, lessons in a backpack kit. Uh, which you can see just behind me here. Um, we have lessons for grades two through grade six. Um, but don't worry if you are not in grade four, um, this program is fantastic uh, for all ages. Uh, we use it at our nature camp, um, which is uh, aged for five years old uh, to 13 years old. So we, we all love tracking um, and learning about the animals that are around us. Uh, so you might be wondering, um, what is animal tracking? So humans have been tracking animals since the beginning of time, um, looking for evidence of what lives around us. Um, most often, um, these other animals, uh, we don't get to see them. Um, they're quite elusive and maybe they only come out at certain times of the day or in certain types of weather. And so by learning how to track animals, uh, we can learn more about them, their behavior, um, what they like, what they don't like, um, where they're traveling to, uh, and we do this for a variety of reasons. Uh, some people have done it for hunting purposes, um, others have done it for research, and at camp we do it just to have a lot of fun. Uh, we like to learn about what, um, what different types of species live around us um, and how we can learn about those species, uh, maybe to protect them or how we can just understand more um, and connect with them a little better. So often, most of the activity uh, of animals happens outside of our view. So maybe it's happening at night, uh, maybe it's happening in the cover of trees like the ones we have behind us. Um, animals can be pretty elusive. So what tracking allows us to do or enables us to do is to learn about these animals, their secret lives, um, without disturbing them. So today we're going to look at how to track using animal prints. So the animal tracks themselves. Um, animals make all different types of prints um, in the earth, in the mud, in the sand, in the snow. Uh, fortunately today uh, we don't have any snow, uh, so we'll be looking at tracks in, in other types of material. So you might be wondering, where do you start when reading an animal track? So there are four key categories that you can start to work in. Uh, one is the size of the animal track. Then you have how many toes does that animal track show? The shape of the animal track, as well as the gait pattern of the animal track that you are looking at. That's assuming that you can see multiple imprints. Um, in the sand or the mud or the snow. So when starting with size, we might as well start big. So here we have a black bear um, print. This black bear print is larger than my hand. So we would say that this is a large animal print. Then we have our medium sized prints. So I have two here, the front and the back print of our friend the beaver. So beaver has a medium sized print. And last but not least, 
we have our friend, the gray squirrel. This one's a little hard to see, so I'll bring it close to you. And that's because it's a small animal print. So if you don't have gray squirrels in your neighborhood, maybe you have chipmunks, black squirrels, red squirrels, all of these creatures and most rodents in North America have small animal tracks. Now we also said that you can look at the number of toes that the animal track shows you. We have a really handy guide at Nature Camp. And you can probably find one like this at your local bookstore, um, or maybe you can order it online um, or print it off the internet. Um, and this guide helps us because it shows us all different animals that are found in North America that have two toes, three, four, or five. So we can also ID our animal friends uh, based on the gait pattern um, that their prints make. So our friend here, the cottontail rabbit, is known as a galloper. So the galloper has its front paws forward and when it jumps, puts its back paws in front before leaping. And most rodents are known as gallopers too. Another type of gait pattern are our diagonal walkers, such as our cats and our dogs. So here we have our friend the fox, who is a diagonal walker. Now this means that they move the front leg at the same time as they move the opposite back leg. Foxes are actually known to step almost directly into their front footprint as they move along. So sometimes it looks like there are only two feet, but there are actually four. They're just making use of that front foot pattern uh, to step into. And this is helpful, especially in the snow. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to walk in another animal's footprints? Try walking like a fox, using both hands and both feet on the ground at the same time. And as you move your left hand forward, move your right foot at the same time. And then when you move your right hand, move your left foot. See if you can step directly into the print that your hands made. Now our bodies aren't designed like a fox. They're not long and sleek. So if anything, it's just a really fun opportunity to see what it would feel like to be a fox. So we also have pacers like our friend the porcupine. Other pacers might be skunks, raccoons, black bears, and they sort of shuffle along. They have bigger bodies, so they move side to side. Now pacers can quickly turn into gallopers when they are trying to move somewhere quickly. Now before we head out on the trail to make some animal prints, maybe one of our friend the otter here, um, we just want to touch base on how we can be out in nature um, and tracking animals while also being mindful um, that those animals are important to the ecosystem, that they need their own space. Um, what we bring onto the land with us when we are making animal prints, we also want to make sure that we bring that equipment home with us and that we aren't leaving it on the land. Uh, we want to make sure that we are leaving love, not litter. So there is no one way to make uh, an animal cast or an animal mold. Uh, we've tried a ton of different styles at camp. Um, sometimes they work really well and sometimes beyond our control they, they fall apart. Um, we've learned a few tips and tricks along the way and over the years um, that we'd like to share with you. Um, sometimes we've done DIY plaster of Paris. Uh, we've had our the most luck um, with a material that we've purchased from Michaels, which is a pre-mixed plaster of Paris. 
as well as the material that we've ordered from Acorn Naturalists, um, which is a company in the United States. So might be a little harder to ship but we really do encourage you to try out your own mixture um, if you want to try a store-bought mixture like we use that's fantastic um, just remember that no matter what um, we're doing this to have fun and to learn and if your plaster doesn't set perfectly the first time um, try it and try it again We're really fortunate at camp um, because we have these really wonderful molds. This one is the red fox. You can see has the four toes, sort of egg shaped. Um, it would be a medium sized print and it looks pretty similar um, to if you have a dog at home um, to the print that your dog might leave in the mud um, or in the snow um, when it's walking through. So on those days where we don't have perfect conditions um, for prints that have been left in the in the earth or in the snow um, we resort to our our molds um, and we like to use the red fox because that's an animal that we see often at all of our nature camp locations throughout the Frontenac arch biosphere um, and it's quite a beautiful creature so the hind foot is different than the front foot because of the, sh the size. So you can see that the hind is a little bit smaller than the front. Um, earlier today I made some casts um, of the front and of the hind foot. So here we have the front. It's a little glary, I'm sorry. Um, and here we have the hind. Um, and so these have dried for over 24 hours. Um, so if you wanted to paint them, they're all ready to go. Um, so today for our um, animal cast that we are making, um, we are going to use the perfect ca cast mixture, which is just behind me here um, in the blue bag. Um, this one we've purchased from Acorn Naturalist. Um, you can also order it off Amazon. Um, we have had really great luck with it. Uh, it it sets really quickly. Um, within 24 hours it's ready to be painted um, and we're looking for a product that can harden um, within the day of our camp so that the campers have something to bring home with them um, at the end of the day. We've also had really great luck with a product that you can get more locally um, at Michael's. Um, this one here which is Craft Smart. Um, it makes about the same amount of prints, so about 15 prints or so, um, and or casts. And um, yeah, we really like this product as well. And it's again, just preference. Uh, sometimes we've had great luck with it, uh, making our own plaster of Paris. And, and then other days, depending on humidity, um, it it's, hasn't worked as well. Um, so we're going to, uh, get started and I have already um, measured out our quantities uh, so with the perfect cast mixture we're using one part water to three parts mixture um, and so the cast mixture is here and I've used a full cup and then here I have a, a one-third of a cup of water um, what we're going to use to mix it in is a recycled yogurt container um, sometimes we find that uh, when we're, we're mixing um, the casting mixture and the water together, it can get a little messy. The high walls of the yogurt container are really helpful with that. Um, so we use this container, we measure it with our measuring cups. We're going to start with the cast mixture inside. And then I'm going to grab a popsicle stick. Uh, if you don't have a popsicle stick, uh, you can use a stick that you found outside or a spoon. Um, we have our water and I'm going to add a little bit first. So just a little. So I've used maybe half of it. I'm going to start mixing it. Um, you should mix it for, you should find that you're having to mix it for about two minutes or so um, once you've added all the water. 
Um, so if you're if you're mixing and thinking you're not getting anywhere, um, just wait, be patient. Um, what we try not to do is to add all the water at the beginning. Um, we've had some pretty um, wet casts made in the past. Um, and especially when we are making them in the snow um, because this uh, mixture will actually heat up as it is setting. Um, we found that if we make the mixture too thin, too runny, uh, that it just doesn't work very well for us. So add the water slowly. I've added about another half of the quantity that I have in total. Um, it's starting to get, starting to get, um, all mixed up and there's still some big clumps there so I want to make sure that I get those clumps out and just keep scraping the walls of the yogurt container as well as the bottom of the yogurt container um, and again take your time um, it's not going to set on you um, in the container here um, not right away anyway so just keep mixing it around and when you feel that it has sort of dried out again. Try adding another half of the amount that you have in your cup or in your container. Ooh. I'm sure you just saw that, which is I've just sprayed this all over my clothes. So that's a great time um, to touch base on what you might want to be wearing. Um, so don't wear your favorite pants or shorts or shirt um, because there's a good chance that you're going to do what I just did, um, which is uh, get it all over yourself. <laughs> so, uh, so we're looking pretty good here. Um, I'm gonna show it to you. It's looking a little, a little runny, um, which is okay it's not the end of the world. It's really hot outside right now too, um, which can definitely have an impact on our mixture. Um, so I'm gonna show you the amount that is left in my, um, in my measuring cup. So I have just a, a little bit of water left in there and I'm not gonna add it. Um, I am pretty happy with the consistency um, that I'm seeing here. So I don't know, hopefully you can see in there the consistency, it's, it's a little runny. That looks pretty good to me. Um, so what we'll do is we're gonna tap it on the table. And the reason we're doing that is to bring any air bubbles to the surface. Um, so we wanna get rid of as much of the air as we can in the mixture. Um, and now we're ready to get our, um, our molds ready for our casts. So before we start pouring into the mold, um, I wanted to share one of the tricks that we found uh, very helpful at camp. And this is great if you are going to be on the trail while making your mixture. Um, rather than bringing a measuring cup out with us, uh, we measure the uh, cast mixture um, into a Ziploc bag. Um, sometimes we also will measure the water into a uh, water empty water bottle. Uh, that way we don't have to carry around additional supplies with us when we're out on the trip. So we are just about ready to pour. I have my mold right here of my um, red fox. So I have the front and I have the, the back. So this one here is the back and this is the front. Um, and I've made enough of the mixture, the cast mixture, to fill both molds. Um, if you're doing this out um, on the land, um, what you might want to consider is finding a print that is um, in in sort of soft earth. So if it's in the mud or if it's in embankment, um, if it's in the snow, you'll want a print that doesn't go all the way down to the earth, um, as you're you're going to have to sort of scoop around the snow in order to lift your print out. Uh, so if it goes right down to the frozen earth, uh, you'll find it a little bit more challenging to to scoop that print. So here, 
I'm going to change the positioning of the camera so you can see how much we're going to put into this print. So just imagine if you're out on the trail um, that this impression has been found um, in this, the wet earth. Um, again, if the, if the print has water in it, you're not going to want to use that one. Try and find one that's already dried out. So you can start to pour your mixture in and you want to get into all those sort of deeper crevices. So where the pad of the foot is, see here you can get the um, sort of the claw marks. And then you're going to want to fill a little over the print. See how it's sort of going over the edge of the print? So you want to go over the edge so that when you lift your print, um, you have a nice base to work from. So you don't have to worry about the toenail breaking off or little pieces breaking off because you have this, the edge, um, sort of to, to safeguard that print. Now you might be wondering how, if I'm doing this in, in nature and on the land and I want to overflow the print, how do I overflow the print without getting it everywhere and making sure that it's thick enough? Well. You can also use another uh, reusable container um, to outline your print with. So to do that, you would take another, whether it be a margarine container or a yogurt container, um, you're going to take that container and you're going to, um, with the help of an adult, uh, you can cut off um, a you can cut off a piece maybe a couple inches deep. So you're going to cut all the way around. And you're going to use that circle to frame your print. So you're going to press it into the earth a little bit or into the snow uh, before you go ahead and fill your, um, your mold or your animal print with the, with the cast mixture. Uh, this will help it so that it has a wall to, um, to stop the flow of the, the cast mixture. And then you get um, sort of that thicker edge um, that will support your print. You'll leave your frame around the cast um, and then when you are ready to remove it, so I would wait as long as you can. Um, they do recommend 45 minutes, um, but if you're pretty anxious or you have somewhere to go, um, you're going to use a small shovel, like a hand shovel or even a spoon uh, to dig around your print and to scoop it up so you'll be taking up some of the earth with you, um, but not too much. And then I would just put that in a bag until you can get to a flat surface and, and let it sit on that flat surface and, and finish setting. Thank you for sharing this time with me, uh, for sharing this space at Mac Johnson Wildlife Area. I hope you've had fun learning about animal tracks and how to make your own animal casts. Um, I hope you give it a try at home and just remember that the most important part in learning how to track animals and learning more about our animal neighbors is by quieting down, taking the time to slow your pace, look around you, and even if it seems like you're all alone in the forest or on that trail, wildlife surrounds you. I hope you have fun. So that just about concludes our time with the Wintergreen Studio BioBlitz. Uh, if you would like to get more information on our Lessons in a Backpack program or the Fab Nature Camp program, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. You can find us at www.fabn.ca. All right, Kelly. Well, thank you so much for that video tutorial. That was very, very thorough. And I know I'm feeling inspired to do some casting in my own backyard. Um, it looks like we do have a couple of questions for you in the Q&A. Before we get to the Q&A, did you want to share anything more about the Veronic Arch Biosphere Network or about your role at the at FABN before we continue? Sure. Um, so I am the program manager for the Fab Nature Camps. Um, the fa family of Fab Nature Camps has 
three different locations. Um, one is where um, that video took place, uh, just north of Brockville, uh, which is in the Frontenac Arch Biosphere uh, Reserve or region. Um, and that is Mac Johnson. Um, we also have another camp that is in Lynnhurst. Um, and that one's at Kendrick's Park. And there's another Fab Camp, uh, Fab Nature Camp at Landon's Bay, uh, which is in Lansdowne and just on the Thousand Islands Parkway. Um, so the Frontenac Arch Biosphere as a region or as a reserve um, is 2,700 square kilometers. So it's quite large. Um, our camps give a nice little cross section of the different, um, some of the different regions found within um, that biosphere reserve. Um, and we are really excited to be able to share our programs um, with the community uh, and, and to share in those experiences um, with nature. And um, yeah, I believe you have a really wonderful presentation um, scheduled on Sunday um, at two o'clock uh, with the Nature Conservancy. Um, and they're going to talk all about um, the Frontenac Arch Biosphere as a region. Uh, so I, I hope some of the people who are here today um, will consider tuning in and, uh, and learning all about the biosphere. Great. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you for um, promoting that session on Sunday. We're looking forward to it as well. Um, so I'm just looking at the Q&A and we've already answered the first question about the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Network. Um, so we'll move on to the second question. What is the biggest print you've casted? And that's from Wes. All right, so that's sort of twofold. Um, we have made um, casts of our, we've, we've made molds and then casts of the black bear print, the large one that you saw in the video. And that was sort of just as an experiment. Um, however, in nature and, and on the land, um, I would say the largest print um, that we have taken would be a large male deer. Yeah, probably that would be the largest um, as their hoofs can be pretty big um, when they're adults. So those ones we, we um, really like to explore in the winter um, in the fresh snow. We can get some really nice prints from those. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, now we have a question from Rena and Monica. They both asked the same thing. How do I get my hands on a lessons in a backpack? Wonderful, so two in one. <laughs> so the lessons in a backpack, um, we have all of the contents of the grade two, three, four, five, and six uh, available on our website, uh, which is www.fabn.ca. So you can download the contents. Um, the physical backpacks, we have a number of sets that are available and they are made available to schools that have contacted us um, outside of sort of our pilot project where the schools were selected and we would deliver the backpacks. Instead, schools can now contact us um, if they would like to use a set for the year. Um, our goal with this program is to share these backpacks. We have about six sets of them. Um, so full sets, so that would be five, pa five backpacks per set um, that we currently have and we would really like to be able to grow that program um, to make them more available throughout the biosphere and to increase the content that we have in the backpacks too. Excellent. Um, now someone asks, can you cast the same print twice? That is a really good question too. Um, if you're using one of those jelly-like molds um, that we have, um, you can use that as many times as you want. And there's a material that you can purchase to make one of those molds. So you can even use your own hand, um, press it into this material that's really jelly-like, um, and then it will sort of solidify and you can use that to pour the casting mixture into as many times as you want. Now, when you're making the cast, which is more of that plaster-like material, the white material you saw in the video, um, you would only be able to pour that into a 
print that you've found in nature one time um, because often it, what's happening is you pour the mixture in and it starts to set and then you're digging that uh, that uh, print as well as the mixture out of the soil or the sand or the snow and so it wouldn't be there um, anymore to use for another print or another cast. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you. We'll see if more questions trickle into the Q&A while I ask the ones that I've written down. Um, what track are you most excited to see when you are out exploring? That's a good question too. Hmm. I, I really enjoy um, the, <laughs> might sound funny, but I really enjoy raccoon tracks. Um, I like the shape of them. They kind of look like little baby prints, like human baby prints. Um, and so I find them really fun. And we see them a lot, uh, especially after some fresh rain. Um, so I find that I find the raccoon prints because the back and the front are so distinctly different. Um, I really like to, to cast the, the raccoon prints. I think our campers would probably um, say that they like print or they like casting uh, from animals that are in the canine family. Um, we, we sort of make a game out of trying to figure out if it's um, a domestic dog uh, versus if it is a wild fox or a coyote um, because we do have both um, on our on the properties where we offer our camps. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, I'm also wondering if there is anything that we can do at home in our, our backyards or in our community to um, help us see tracks a little easier. Yeah, I think that the first thing that we can do is, as I mentioned in the video, just really slow it down. Um, sometimes we're on such a mission to, um, to exercise or that, you know, we have 45 minutes for a walk or a wander. Um, and because we're focused on that, we don't always look down and look around. Um, and so I, I think that the first thing to do is to maybe go out on your next hike or your next wander um, with a, a different intention, um, which would be to notice what's around you. Um, you can also um, have a look, I would say even after tomorrow, we're supposed to have a lot of rain. Um, so if you, when you first go out after the rain tomorrow, um, have a look around you, uh, look in the mud, um, look in the grass even, um, to see if there are any impressions that you can find. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. And we just had a question come in from Brian who says, how do you distinguish a coyote track from a domestic dog track? The trick we use at camp mostly is, um, is the size. It does have a slightly different shape to it. Um, we're still very much practicing um, our identification skills. Uh, so we usually resort to our guide, um, which helps give the distinguishing features um, and how well you can see the, um, the claws in the print um, is one of the distinguishing features. But yeah, we do resort to our, our print guides and our, our tracking guides a lot during camp. Um, we have laminated versions that we can take out on the trail with us. Um, we also measure the tracks. Um, so we create measuring sticks um, where we've, you know, we've taken a stick um, and we put notches on it um, using it might be thread or we've used elastic um, to measure out different distances and then we use that to help us as well determining um, the size when we're out um, on our wanders which helps us to ID the coyote versus the dog. Um, at one of our parks or one of our camps um, we almost always are seeing um, domestic dog tracks um, because there are so many domestic dogs that are traveling through and then at another one of our parks off trail um, and where we're, we're not really in an area that someone would be walking their dog you can almost guarantee that one's a coyote. 
Great, thank you. Um, and I have another question for you. I'm wondering, since we are going to be outside for this event and exploring and looking for um, different animals in our community, what would be the top three most common tracks that you would find in the summer versus maybe your top three in the winter? Ooh, more good questions. Um, I would say top three, maybe we'll start with top three in the winter. Um, and I can only speak from our experience at camp. Um, the top three in the winter for us are definitely rabbit. Um, we do cast and see quite a lot of rabbit tracks in the snow. Um, we see a lot of deer tracks in the snow. Um, and I would say canine. Um, so often at our camps, we're seeing um, domestic dog tracks. Um, but we've, we've definitely seen um, a couple um, coyote tracks in the, in the winter. Um, I would say in the summertime, um, domestic dogs <laughs> we're seeing a lot at camp uh raccoons and and squirrels um we see a lot of squirrel tracks uh what's nice though too um to keep your eyes open for especially if you live around um a body of water so one of our camps is located on lower beverly lake and we get a lot of waterfowl tracks um, so in the video we talked a lot about um, mammals and tracking mammals but um, it's important this time of year to keep in mind that you can make some and find some really cool animal prints um, from our winged friends too so keep your eyes open um, on the banks of rivers or lakes and in the sand um, and right now it's not a track that you're going to easily be able to make a print out of um, but keep your eyes open for turtle tracks so you'll see little swishes in the sand and um, that would be from their legs and their claws as well as from their shell um, they might be exploring um, as this is their nesting season Kelly, thank you so much for coming on today and answering all of these questions and sharing that video with us. Um, I really appreciated your invitation to slow down as we're exploring and looking for, for signs of animals during this bio blitz and then of course beyond the bio blitz as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing this time and this space with me virtually. And uh, I hope that everybody takes the opportunity to, um, to yeah, slow it down. And whether it's raining or sunny, um, just to take an extra moment outside um, and enjoy. So thank you so much for participating in this session. Have a wonderful evening and happy exploring.